All right, hello everybody. My name is Juan Francisco Saldarriaga. I work with Laura at the Center for Spatial Research. Um, and I am here to introduce the next panel, which I'm very excited about. Um, we're gonna hear from Dietmar Offenhuber and Mitch McEwen. And I think it's gonna be a great, um, a great session. Dietmar uh, is an assistant professor at Northwestern University, where he works at the um, School of Art and Design and Public Policy. And he has a PhD from MIT from planning, um, a master's of science in art and design, master's of science in media, arts, and sciences, and a diploma in architecture. So as you can see, he straddles both spheres between design and governance and policy constantly. And what I'm really looking forward to is that he has a very broad and generous view of design. And he really tries to understand how design interacts with governance, with informality, with policy. So that's a talk that's gonna really address the, the topic of today. How do we learn about cities through different methods of looking into it? And uh, Mitch McEwen, our second panelist, she is an assistant professor at the School of Architecture at Princeton University. She's also the principal of McEwen Studio and one of the co-founders of An Office. And she has received multiple grants and awards. She has exhibited in the Venice Biennale, in the Istanbul Biennale. And the one thing I, I really appreciate about Mitch's work is that she's not afraid to be provocative and to engage with the purely political aspect of architecture. She really um, sees architecture as a political act and through design, through her exhibitions and through her writing, she challenges how architecture shapes our political environments, how it reflects our political conditions, and how the public can play a role in our cities. So again, I'm really excited about this two um, talks. And we're gonna start with Dietmar presenting his talk, Platform, and, Platform Man and the Bricoleur. Please join me and welcome them too. Yeah, thank you, Sean, for this uh, generous introduction, and uh, thanks everyone for inviting me. Uh, though it's kind of a bit hard to uh, follow up on this uh, absolute brilliant set of three talks in the morning. Um, so, um, ten years ago, almost to the very date, uh, the designer Dan Hill published uh, his essay, "The Street as Platform," which uh, was very influential in, in the whole smart city crowd. And uh, in this text, he didn't really talk about future technologies, but he described a very banal and everyday street th scene through uh, all the different uh, uh, events of data capturing and transferring and, and interaction. And uh, <clears throat> looked at this uh, through the lens of then contemporary technology, which already in 2008 uh, occupied a, a substantial footprint uh, in the city, uh, which led him to uh, assert that without this infrastructure, uh, the street only half exists. So the past decade then was really characterized uh, by the desire of many planners, governance, uh, companies and uh, you know, amateurs and hackers to, to build urban data platforms uh, that would embrace and ca capture all these uh, disparate activities. Uh, while Dan Hill was, uh, there was a slightly ironic undertone, so half of the uh, data processes that he described uh, failed and didn't really work. But this, this irony was, was mostly missing from uh, all the following uh, large scale initiatives to create these data platforms. But I also think that uh, on a more general level, um, almost all conceptualizations of urban technology assume the need for some kind of platform. Uh, a platform that enables collective action, creativity, governance. Uh, but very often it's framed as a not just yet uh, stance that once we have the platform finished, uh, then all these magical things will happen. So this creates a kind of a, a chicken and egg problem. If the platforms and the network effects are the prerequisite for uh, collective engagement, uh, how do platforms themselves uh, take shape? 
Uh, in open source development, this is often described as a, as a recursive relationship. Uh, in order to build something, you first have to build the tools, and those tools are again uh, uh, composed of other tools that have to be built and so on. And, and this fascination for recursion is also visible in all these uh, recursive acronyms, uh, GNU is not Unix, and things like that. Um, and uh, Chris Kelty, uh, anthropologist, describes this community through his concept of uh, recursive publics. Uh, a, a public that is concerned with the maintenance uh, of the infrastructure that at the same time is the basis of its own discourse. So uh, the platform is never finished, it's always in, in a kind of beta condition. Um, instead of this a little bit mechanistic concept of recursion, I prefer uh, to look at it through a lens of improvisation. Uh, in a way, building a plane while flying it, and uh, almost uh, like a, a process of call and response where multiple actors adjust uh, the individual components they're working with. Um, my, my talk is gonna be about these improvisational relationships between platforms and, and social practices. I'm going to use a, a recent project that I worked on with my colleague uh, Katja Schechtner um, about uh, the street lighting system and the electricity infrastructure of Manila as a case study. Um, and uh, so the way I see it is that, that platforms are not really a stable basis on top of which interaction and other things develop, uh, but they obviously change through, a, through their use. And, and it is uh, a little bit complicated because on the one hand, practices of appropriation and uh, you know, sometimes subvert or even sabotage uh, the platform um, or the designer's intention. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes they're also necessary for the platform uh, to work in the first place uh, because the designer's intentions didn't really encompass uh, all the different facets of reality. Uh, Steve Graham and uh, Nigel Thrift have uh, written about that extensively. So in my talk, I'm going to focus on the uh, electricity system and the streetlight system in Manila, which, which is a, a very good example for improvisational governance, uh, something that we termed infrastructure. So the question is, what happens when, uh, when a new component of this infrastructure lands in the city seemingly out of nowhere? Uh, in this case, a smart grid initiative that is pushed by Meralco, the local uh, utility company. And if you look at the rhetoric in these ads, uh, they are, they're very generic and, and exchangeable. So it, it really resembles the smart city rhetoric everywhere uh, on the world. And of course, this is also a common criticism of the smart city. Uh, Adam Greenfield, for example, talks about how uh, the smart city solutions are always generic in space, generic in time, uh, placeless. Uh, but I think we, we should not confuse uh, the, the rhetoric of the ads with the underlying motivations um, and, and assume that a smart city salesperson has convinced a completely clueless, naive uh, city government uh, to buy something that they don't need. Uh, I think on the side of the city there are very specific expectations and there's a specific local context, although it's, it's never really spelled out uh, and, and it, it remains somewhat hidden. Uh, Manila, of course, has, has ongoing infrastructure uh, issues. There's an explosive growth of the city after the Second World War, um, which also has led to uh, insufficient coverage of, of basic utility services, uh, insufficient resources in the planning departments. Uh, the privatization of the late 90s and early 2000s did not really solve this. They, they made it in many ways worse, uh, especially since now uh, the city has to deal with a lot of different actors who are all entangled with each other in, in complex uh, relationships of, of dependency. And uh, uh, the Philippines also has among the highest uh, electricity costs in the world, both in relative and absolute terms. What, what is however interesting is that uh, the infrastructure 
uh, in the street looks a little bit different than we usually would expect. So it's very, the street lights are very idiosyncratic. Uh, they are very, very colorful, don't really fit this stereotype of the invisible infrastructure that's in the background. Uh, here is really very much in your face and it, it comes in a confusing um, range and in a variety. So uh, we, we had this uh, studio trip with students um, where we tried to map all the different lamp types and whether they work or not and uh, which technology are they using. And uh, in this really small region in, in Paco, which is in the center of Manila, uh, we, we counted uh, more than uh, 25 different uh, lamp types, which were all official uh, illuminaries from, from the city. And uh, this notion of bricolage is, of course, also obvious in, in street scenes. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, repair and appropriation by citizens. You know, we have uh, you know, the fiesta decoration or the, um, the, the laundry. And all of that looks, of course, very uh, illegible, but it follows a very uh, strict logic again, because of the high electricity prices and uh, the street level bureaucrats know exactly how much uh, wattage, for example, this particular lamp, which is part of the official uh, street lighting system, uh, would consume. And of course, all the different uh, wires are color coded and have, have uh, different purposes. Um, on the user side, there is a uh, informal electricity market, uh, which, for example, involves that property owners rent out power uh, to street vendors. Here we see just this cable going across the fence, uh, which makes it possible for the, the vendors to sell their food. But of course, they pay a premium for this uh, electricity, which, which is uh, actually very expensive. Um, but an interesting thing is also that the local government improvises. So here, this is a, a chairman of the local council who works with residents to provide street light in, in dark alleyways that are not covered by the official street lighting system. Uh, but also the other way around, uh, they would uh, provide electricity to poor families by just hooking them up to the street lighting system uh, to, to give them uh, electricity. And of course, the you know, improvisation always involves a certain urgency. It, it, it means that you have to make a decision in the moment with the resources that are available to you. And uh, the, the local council in, in these little neighborhoods, of course, also have a difficult relationship with the utility company and with the city. And so, so they, they, they are limited in their agency. And uh, this, I think, uh, is very consistent with what uh, Manuel Castells and Alejandro Portes uh, talk about the st um, uh, structuralist perspective on informality, where uh, informality is not something that is outside the formal system, but actually inside and <clears throat> uh, fills, fills the gaps in the formal system. And we see this in the way how street lights are repaired. So we see, again, one of these colorful sculptural street lamps uh, but unfortunately, it's not working, so someone has pulled out a wire and uh, connected it to a nearby lamp uh, that is then uh, maintained. So, so we see that, you know, just to, to provide those basic functions uh, always requires some informal acts of, of repair and, and, and maintenance. And our approach is to look at this uh, through the lens of, of informal uh, improvisation. Uh, so governance is, is, is a process where the actors, in the absence of, 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 of clear arrangements, constantly react to each other's actions. And, and this is a, a constant tug of war, a renegotiation. Unlike in this you know, call and response in chess, it's not always a, a very harmonious relationship. So those actors who, who improvise together can also be antagonistic. Um, so they have, different, they have different interests and uh, using a very small example, I will show that we also need to understand the smart grid initiative through this uh, improvisational lens. Uh, 
Uh, for the utility company, of course, one of their main concern is stated concern about electricity theft, where, um, I mean, they have a very inefficient system of, of uh, delivery that has a lot of system loss, but they mostly blame it uh, on people stealing electricity, which is, of course, a very dangerous uh, uh, activity that also leads to fires when the, the transformers uh, overheat. So what the utility company decided to do about it is uh, to come up with, with these new systems which are elevated metering clusters. So what happens is basically you take off the electricity meter from the house and uh, put it on these poles so people cannot really reach it and can uh, jump the electricity. Um, and, but then this means that you have all these cables uh, running from this meter cluster uh, to the individual household. And, and those meters, uh, those cables uh, have orange color and is supposedly tamper proof. So whenever someone tries to, to get uh, electricity, they, they shut down. But since it's behind the meter, it would also count. Uh, so they would not necessarily lose money through that. Uh, but it also makes it slightly inconvenient for the company. For example, the, uh, the surveyors, the meter readers, uh, use binoculars uh, <laughs> twice a month to, to read the meter, uh, and you know, which, which is, which is uh, slightly um, inconvenient. But uh, the city, who was surprised by this, uh, in a true improvisational response, uh, started to regulate these uh, cables where they said, okay, uh, you can do this, but you can only uh, have uh, 10 uh, wires per cluster, so uh, we don't have this visual clutter of all these systems. Uh, so we see that there is a kind of a response to a particular action which turns into a new policy. Um, but then, of course, this also has material and, and aesthetic um, implications. So those are very, very visible uh, installations. And to some extent, they become almost, a, a, they, can, they become a marker for a, a poor neighborhood. Uh, wherever you see those, those poles, this means that there was an issue with electricity theft. Uh, and uh, some of the council members in, in neighboring neighborhoods said, well, we don't have those, you know, we are uh, on a higher level. Um, but those residents in, in these um, neighborhoods that actually have those metering clusters uh, are also proud of them because it shows that, okay, everything is in order and they are connected to the system. And uh, I see that there's a very interesting phenomenon of using those infrastructure installations as a communication system. Uh, how it's very apparent that there's always uh, political uh, messages next to those big installations because you know one of these uh, clusters shows that, okay, the, the local council has done their job and they have provided electricity. So it's, infrastructure is not something generic, but it, it, it really conveys a message at the local level. Whereas uh, most theoretical accounts always look at infrastructure at the systemic level. And which brings us back to the street lights, which then become uh, uh, political messages in, in a very literal sense. So uh, at the boundary between two neighborhoods, we have on the one side a, uh, functioning street lights, on the other side uh, not. So this is, a, this is a very clear message. But this also means that uh, it's no longer important that all the street lights work. They only need to work in very particular places. So, uh, as a conclusion, uh, I think this process of, of platform building, we have to look at it as a, uh, as, as a bricolage that is never stable, that is constantly dismantled and, and rebuilt uh, in, an, in an ongoing process of, of improvisation. And this process is not finished. Uh, I mentioned the problem with the binoculars, so uh, Meralco is looking at different ways to uh, identify power theft and they're looking at smart meters, how they can uh, analyze the, the signal and uh, as maybe some might know, if you have a, a very fine-grained uh, signal from a smart meter, you can even uh, figure out 
which TV programs or which uh, movies you watch because all of these activities of power consumption have a very specific signature. So, so with that, uh, they, they would uh, no longer need uh, to have all these uh, complicated uh, installations. And of course, they are actively exploring these things. They are commissioning a PhD thesis at the local university to uh, develop algorithms for, for this stuff. And uh, constantly, uh, as uh, Orit said, you know, experiment, make new test beds. Uh, uh, last year, they talked about drones uh, for mapping the power grid. Now they talk about blockchain. And so <laughs> we see that, you know, there's, uh, but uh, of course we can, we can really dismiss this as a, uh, just jumping on the latest trends in technology, but I think it, it all is, is, is very closely connected to this local need uh, of the different actors for Meralco to really understand uh, how, what, <laughs> what their users do on the system and for the city to somehow overcome their limitations uh, and for the citizens to somehow get on with their life. So I think uh, urban technologies play a somewhat paradoxical role in this. Uh, on the one hand, it's often presented as something that informalizes all interactions. If you think of 311 systems where everyone can uh, send a request without going through all the hierarchies and might even get a response from the, from the mayor. And, uh, a lot of the rhetoric has focused on the informal, uh, on this informalization of coordination. But I think at the same time, it's, it's formalizing, it's very formalizing because every interaction is encoded into categories, uh, ha requires a very particular um, set of, of agreements, uh, and if you think of smart contracts, you know, all of that is, is very rigid, uh, which of course also means that uh, those those um, categories and those very hard encodings constantly break and, and need to be fixed somehow. So uh, there, there is this, this constant struggle and this tension between, between these two things. Uh, but we don't really notice it because there's an active effort to hide this uh, through purely aesthetic means. You know, if you think of uh, uh, Uber's interface, it looks exactly the same in every city, but of course behind the scenes, uh, the company has to negotiate with every city and uh, constantly, you know, uh, has to renegotiate, which leads to different arrangements. So it, it's, it's not as clean as it, it might look from the interface. And I think uh, Amazon was very smart with uh, using uh, the Mechanical Turk uh, as, a, um, as a name for one of its products because it's, it's a perfect way of describing this, you know. From the outside, it looks like a uh, robot, like a clean algorithm, but inside there's constantly this uh, tug of war and this improvising and uh, um, back and forth. So, thank you very much. Um, so, modern watercraft. I I'm going to be presenting two modes of what I call modern watercraft. And, and of course, m modernity is outmoded, right? So, um, but I think what, what the, the study of, of modernity or just modern watercraft, what, what part of what I'm kind of teasing out um, is how in being outmoded, this modern watercraft supplements itself and responds to its own crises, which become part of its persistence. Um, so the first part of my talk, which is located in Detroit, um, the, the, this is dealing with the watercraft of shutoffs, and and the important thing, the important thing here is um, understanding that water shutoffs are not a bug but a feature um, in in the infrastructure of of watercraft. So so the shutoffs are a feature. What I'll show are a feature of a, of the network design where treatment and maintenance processes are centralized and water delivery is widely distributed to subsidize sprawl 
and, and this is the watercraft of shutoffs, as much defined by austerity politics in Homo economicus as by sewer lines and, and interceptors. The second form of watercraft that I will present briefly is in Mexico City, where it's a, a watercraft of, of what I call a profound modernity. Um, and then I end with the reading of local activism in Mexico City in terms of a, a political ecology of muck, which I think, I think is a bit, a bit hopeful. Um, so, so I, I want to begin um, briefly, I will begin briefly with the architectural work that I've been doing in Detroit for the past four years or so, which is primarily dealing with vacant houses in city-owned land, uh, both of which are plentiful in the city of Detroit. I, I begin with these not so much for the sake of chronology and the work, but to situate these investigations of infrastructure as entirely material to architecture. And I, I mean material in an evidentiary sense. So, so how do we design within these situations, not reducing them to images or not obfuscating them with a projected, a, a, a kind of vague emotional responses, things like affect. Um, so to imagine that this infrastructure study might be relevant in architecture and vice versa is to take seriously Lefebvre's argument that space is space, not similar or analogous from one space to another, but actually consistent from the abstract space of mathematics to the lived space of the city and its streets. So in, in Detroit, we see the emergence of infrastructure and resource management to accompany a spatial and an economic and a racial order within the city. This is, this is kind of what brought me to, to Detroit, is, is working on, on one um, property in a kind of investigatory way, and then finding that, that I needed, in order to continue working, I needed a pile of money very quickly, and then, and then artists brought this pile of money to my house. <laughs> so, um, water shutoffs are just one of many procedures, from tax foreclosure to eviction, uh, that are enabled by algorithms of pricing and payment. These procedures and algorithms generate an instance of a contemporary urban divide. But this divide is no longer one of borders and closed polygons, right? And it's not the kind of red line maps or the zoning maps that we're used to. The suburb inner city distinction and its concentric order continues to generate socioeconomic effects, but its effects do not coalesce in the same mid 20th century pattern of center and periphery. Instead, it's this kind of shut off. Um, so, so I started investigating this. Uh, this is really the neighborhood where I, I've done most of the work in Detroit. Since then, I'm moving east, but kind of staying close to the waterfront. Um, and so this, is, so, uh, this, so this is where I'll be fleshing out an analysis of watercraft um, and then zooming out to the whole metro area to understand just what's happening in this neighborhood. I, I call this infrastructure logic watercraft, building off, of course, uh, Keller Easterling's notion of extra statecraft. Like extra statecraft, watercraft is beyond the governance of statecraft. It is the management of privatizing and respatializing resources. It is fluid, yet it is capable of evicting residents, criminalizing households, and rendering faucets, fixtures, and toilets useless, all from the manipulation of a spreadsheet. Um, and here, what, what other than these three projects that I'll show quick, quickly, this whole field of red that you're seeing is um, demolitions and, and brownfields. So this, this really started for me trying to understand um, how this, this field of, of not just vacancy, but, but, but other processes um, were, were contributing to this kind of churn in the city, it, kind of boarding up certain things, turning certain things on and off, and then dumping certain things into holes in the ground. Um, so it's really not a situation of kind of emptiness. It, it's very much a situation of, of various levels of toxic, toxicity, um, brown fields, demolitions, and, and evictions, and that's that's what I was I was trying to understand. My first kind of drawing this. Um, so to, to quickly briefly go through the the, the architectural scale projects, um, House Opera is really a study of what happens with a house that is sort of bricked in the way that a cell phone is bricked, with no no electricity, any of that. Can it still uh, Can it still be? designed as a space, you know, to do something um, that, that really is, is regarding this in a way as a found object, right? So, so this becomes um, uh, a kind of performance space rather than a space, it becomes a, a public performance space rather than a privatized space for living. Um, this is a speculative project for the Venice Biennale, which was concerned with a very dense housing possibility um, and freighting and a kind of uh, reparative, uh, kind of pollution repair happening um, in one location. And this is a, a project in construction now, um, which is, is very much about plants and a kind of investment model. Um, also a repurposed kind of uh, uh, land bank house. 
Um, but to go back to the, the Venice Biennale, this is uh, a kind of reading of, of this area of Detroit as, as a border, as an international border. Um, this is the, the project that's called Promised Air, and it's very concerned with, with Detroit as a border city. It's a border with Canada. So on the bottom there, Windsor, it's, it's heavy freighting. Um, but, but as I was starting to understand Detroit as this kind of border condition, really what was happening um, in relationship to that sort of brown field, those dots that I showed you, um, was, was a lot of activism around, around water. Um, and, and so even though the, the activism itself um, and the protests are, are very concerned with the discourse of rights and natural rights and a kind of right to water, which um, I, I, I just politically, I don't think that those, those kinds of ways of organizing natural rights uh, will, will work in this context. Um, but at the same time, there, there was also um, just, just questions around the relationship between, between sewage and citizenship that I thought were very, very provocative and worth investigating. Specifically, where do you expect us to shit, right? That's what the protest sign is saying. Um, and so in, in that way, I wanted to understand um, the, the kind of imagination of water, right? And this is literally an old license plate that, that is in that neighborhood that I showed you of Southwest Detroit, um, um, where it's really, a city that is, is, is surrounded by, by the Great Lakes, which I'll show you in a bit. But, but what that automobile points to is this specific moment in, that you can kind of, if you go to the archives, locate in, in terms of 1966 in, in, in a, a plan for pollution control. So what's key here is the dual authority of sewage and water. Um, and this was formalized at the height of the Department of Water Services suburban expansion. Um, the, this, this, this map here is looking at this moment in 1966, um, which I get into more in an article in Prospecta. But, but, this, but the Detroit is located um, in, in the middle of the Great Lakes, which is the largest kind of freshwater resource. Um, so, so how can there be these, these shutoffs in something like a crisis? Um, how is it possible to have a water crisis in, in the midst of this, this, this water abundance? So the, the, while the processes of water intake have remained unencumbered in Detroit since the late 19th century, um, the processing of sewage has consistently failed to maintain clean waterways from the city's first sewer in 1836 to today. Um, and this is largely due to Detroit's combined sewer system but cannot be disassociated from the suburban service expansion. Um, that's what I'll flesh out. So, so effectively, this whole kind of myth of Detroit, you know, being vacant and declining, um, you know, the moment, I'm, I'm afraid to do a pointer, but if you just look around 1960, you know, this kind of idea of this centralizing network being, being designed for this expansion makes total sense in terms of just looking at this, um, this, this population growth. Um, so, so what was designed effectively was a large part of the runoff from storms, including the entire runoff from small storms and the highly contaminated first flush of the very large storms, um, is, is retained in the system for complete treatment at the regional wastewater plant, uh, which I'm showing there with that, that one circle. Um, and everything that you're seeing in yellow are these combined sewer overflow events, which of course you know, occur in Detroit along with the, the wastewater treatment plant itself. Um, and so the, the stormwater monitoring and remote control system you know, reduces the risk of basement flooding um, with, and, and preserves the value of the single family house um, at the same time. So for the metro suburbs, right? So maybe that's clear if I go back, right? So this whole gray area outside of the light gray um, is all the metro suburbs. And this is the whole sewered area. Um, and so there's this whole network of these telemeter devices that make sure that all of the, the wastewater goes into Detroit to be, to be processed and not floods into the basement of the single family home in, in the dark gray area. Um, right, so these single family homes that find themselves connected to an overflowing sewer line during heavy rain events, in instead these kind of telemetering devices um, you know, kind of send the, the, the first flush to, to Detroit. Um, this consolidated centralized effects of flooding in a way that shifts the risk impacts of heavy rain events from the metro area single family house to the city of Detroit. Um, and here's, here's I, I, the, the public, even though there's extensive public GIS data, um, the actual sewer lines are, are not public. So here's me speculating from the sewer area and the, and the paved streets and then also smaller um, sewage plants that don't do that much actual processing because the telemeter devices make sure that the real processing keeps occurring in the wastewater treatment plant. Um, 
So, so then th this is all kind of facilitated by these very weird contraptions, um, meters um, that monitor, report, sense, and transmit this, this information. Um, uh, so, so a lot of um, this kind of information, even though this, this telemetering is happening, it doesn't actually deliver itself as evidence um, in the moments that evidence are required for, for legal cases. So what I mean by that is that there's, with the emergence of the Environmental Protection Agency and the Clean, Wa Clean Water Act of 1972, the federal government sued the state of Michigan for its CSO data, combined sewer overflow, for, so, sorry, not for the data, for the combined sewer overflow into the freshwater of the Detroit River. So just because of those yellow dots that I showed you. Um, this lawsuit continued for decades, giving the state's judicial courts, not engineers, not planners, not democratically elected officials, but just judges, uh, a leading role in the management of Detroit's urban and suburban watercraft. Um, so my, my, my question about this is how actually could it become evidence? Um, you know, how could it be hacked? Um, the, there are other questions that I have. Um, but sort of zooming out to the whole city, um, this series of maps spatializes the water infrastructure as a form of wealth transfer effectively from a 50% poor majority black urban population to a wealthy majority white suburban population. And in, in a way, I just sort of wonder, you know, how is this possible, right? 50 years after the civil rights movement and black power, right? How, how is this really possible? Um, and, and shifting back to the neighborhood scale, you know, the house then becomes an odd artifact of time. It becomes a very material thing to be understood in terms of networks of infrastructure, but also in terms of time and our expectations of time. Um, so that's where I want to connect this to a, a, another um, site that I'm thinking through, Modern Watercraft, um, which is a, a very different situation. But I want to I want to pause because I actually find art critics and theorists sometimes more helpful on this than the kind of typical infrastructure and technology crowd. And um, Georges Didi Huberman is someone in, in talking um, through the, the archaic in Paris um, that, that, that I'm, I'm thinking through a lot of this with. Um, these, this broader question of time, cities, technology, and time. There, there's an assumption that cities chart time, right? An expectation that a series of maps will read like a chart or improve like a piece of technology. We read cities very differently than we read, say, hair or clothing, right? With hairstyles especially, we mark time, but not so much its progress. Um, there are certain hair or clothing styles that we do not expect to inhabit the same space or the same time, like a wedding dress and sweatpants. Um, but but can, do, do, uh, cities maybe also consist of matter that's more like that, right? Um, and so that, that's, that's not um, entirely to say flat, that these, these pieces of infrastructure have a kind of flattened effect, um, but also that they might not necessarily be progressive and sequential. So perhaps the object and materials that make up the systems of a city do not have to be self-consistent, but can be dispersed and relational. Um, so in, in that way, I want to turn to Mexico City um, to look at another situation of watercraft that presents a way of schematizing modern wa watercraft as well as a mode of resistance against it. Um, but my writing in Mexico City, um, and it's dealing with modernities of an overly draining water infrastructure, very different than the Detroit situation. Um, this is a form of something that I, I, I'm calling profound modernity. Um, profound modernity has a troubled relationship to maintenance. The, the extensive reshaping that modernity demands from urbanism, reshaping what, what lies beneath our feet in terms of sidewalks, streets, and building foundations, is related not only to rational engineering, but to speculation, image, the collapse of great distances, right? Um, and, and so there's a burring of maintenance in all of this. And in, in Mexico City, um, one doesn't need to uncover um, anything. This is not even a scene from the earthquake. This is before the earthquake. Um, and, and with the, with the so the, the whole thing with the, the gutter rag that I, see if I can squeeze it in here. Um, George Didi Huberman, he writes about this fabric in the gutters of Paris, which are a bit like rolled up sweatpants, um, that, that he sees as, as a kind of return of the archaic. And in Didi Huberman's reading of Benjamin and the sewer fabrics of Paris, the city becomes a series of artifacts and organs, organs without a body. Despite the 19th century house manian boulevards and sewer system of modern Paris, the archaic mucky rags remain. For Didi Huberman, these rags are potent objects of study, um, both for how they return as archaic objects into the temporality of modernism and how they inhabit images. 
So there's this, there's this artist, Eileen Flesher, who will go back to rephotograph this, this, what he calls a doormat. Um, but, but it turns out that if, um, you know, if you actually look at the Paris sewer system, not, not as, an, uh, as an artist, but as someone who can read sections, right, that the rag and the underground system are actually symptomatic of each other. And they're born of the same time period. When, when Belgrand, the director of water and sewers of Paris, under Hausmann, designed this two-in-one water system for the new boulevard, so you actually have untreated water the kind of gray water from the River Ork that's coming out of here in this rolled up fabric is laid in front of the gutters to channel the direction of the water um, so that it cleans the street before it drains down. And my whole argument about Mexico City is that in effect the, this Juraneji Profundo, this huge, huge infrastructure project that's been going on since the 70s, is a kind of Hausman Boulevard ambition that totally forgets those rags. Right, a kind of, and I think this goes back to the talk just before me about improvisation. That actually, these 19th century kind of early modern infrastructure, they, they depend also on these 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 soft moments of, of improvisation already. But there's a kind of odd rereading of them as as overly rationalized and formalized that forgets that forgets the rags, really, and forgets the maintenance of the rags, um, and so. There's, there's a, an issue here of maintenance versus control. Um, when, um, yeah, so like the street, the street rags of Paris are these kind of instruments not of control but of hunches or gestures, right? Asking kind of which way the water should go, kind of nudging the fabric versus this extensive, um, effectively the Juranaje Profundo, it drains the, the former lake of Mexico City so extensively that then potable water needs to be pumped up um, from the aquifer and then delivered by these, by these extensive trucks. So I'm just gonna close with a, with a protest um, against the project that, that doesn't initially seem to be about water, but I think is very much about water. Um, this was a proposal for a public space in Mexico City that protesters uh, shut down as a proposal. It was going to be kind of like the high line of Mexico City effectively. Um, and, and it seems, you know, initially that the folks who protested this, they, it was for a neighborhood, um, it was called the Chapultepec, this, this Avenida Chapultepec, and the folks who protested it, they, they protested with hashtag Chapultepec, S-H-O-P, um, just sort of calling out that the whole project was really about privatizing the street. Um, but but I, I, I want to assert that uh, some of the kind of activism on the ground might be much more aware of the political ecology than we tend to give it credit for, and, and that this kind of Chapultepec project um, is actually very much was an attempt to uh, continue the privatization of water with this kind of fake diagram of, of water as a kind of org chart. Um, and, and I just want to then posit that this, this, this sort of Mexico City protest might be a form of what Bruno Latour calls a political ecology. And as Latour notes about the gap between local politics and global ecology, you know, we have problems, but we don't have the publics to go with them. In these local conflicts over commerce and streets, the burgeoning of what Bruno Latour has called the seventh regime of political ecology, detached from romanticism of the natural and liberated from the rational humanist subject might be witnessed. The city stews with objects and matter already politicized amidst legacy systems entangled with muck. Um, so, the, the, so, I mean, we can also look at these as drawings that are these kind of terrible diagrams or this terrible raster ground. Um, the task of political ecology in Mexico City would not be to return the city to a natural lake that can host its local species, um, which are rapidly going extinct. Right? And neither would it be to simply resist every privatization of public space. I think in, in, in protesting the, the public status of streets and drainage, the protests for Chapultepec um, implicitly posit that the public apparatus of Mexico City's drainage projects might become another kind of environment capable of negotiating various uncertain survival of species, in, including our own. Thank you. So I, we're going to go for a small discussion. We have about 10 minutes. OK, so first of all, thanks for those wonderful talks. Um, I'll start with a question. I, I see in both of your talks, um, a lot of images and a lot of emphasis on appropriation of infrastructure, on 
hacking infrastructure, on um, subverting infrastructure, on, on how do the people and the state and companies act through infrastructure and, and take charge of infrastructure. And in the end, maybe what's, I think something that's happening underneath everything is um, very strong power dynamics between governments, residents, and companies. So I wanna, I wanna ask you, where do these appropriations, where do these interventions, where does this informality become resistance, political resistance, or when is it just an act of survival, an act of people trying to carry, carry on? Or is it always an act of political resistance? Well, one of the, one of the things that I'm, I'm working on with water is, is actually an alternative to what you just said. Because I think at the architectural scale, my work on houses has been more like, yeah, let's just go cut it open, you know? And, and I think, you know, in, in investigating what the, the, the more layered process is, um, that are happening with, with the water shutoffs in the neighborhood and how that then facilitates the, the vacancies. Um, when I talk about kind of hacking those, those meters, it's not so much, I mean, I have talked to activists about just turning an interceptor off and seeing what happens, right? But, but I, I don't think that's really productive. Um, what, what I think is more productive is the possibility of something like a FOIA request, you know, Freedom of Information Act, that says let's, you know, gather, because it's actually in Detroit, and I think, I think Detroit is in some ways a very specific place, but maybe this is going on a lot and we don't really know how to look for it. Um, you know, you would think that anything that operates based on the kind of financialization um, and, and this concern about, about payments and spreadsheets, right, would be um, from, happening from corporations. But it's actually a, a fake market that's not a market, that's a set of rate settlement agreements that's set up between um, suburban authorities and the city um, that's facilita facilitated through another authority that's kind of quasi-governmental. So that's why for me Keller Easterling's work is so important because it's not always just a company or, or the city government, right? Um, and so, and, and these rate settlement agreements set, set the water prices. So it's actually, for me, much more productive to understand um, things like poverty and race than, than the kind of market condition, because it's not a market condition, for example. And, and, and the legalities, um, it's not so much informal versus legal practices. Um, I, I think what, what I'm hoping from, from the work um, is that, that, that it will open up other realms of, of activism that can happen very much within the bureaucratic um, situation. You know? so, so really changing the ongoing, um, the, these, these, these lawsuits that are never ending around mm -hmm. things like environmental controls and building more spatial intelligence and spatial data into them. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in my case, uh, I think there's definitely a, a pol political element uh, to it, uh, also very explicitly around the streetlights. You know, there's discussion around corruption and w where these uh, lamps come from, also the high electricity prices. So uh, acts of appropriation definitely can be uh, acts of uh, political protest. Um, I, I find myself uh, increasingly uh, unable to really draw these dichotomies between, let's say, you know, city versus uh, resident, formal versus informal, appropriation versus centralized planning, uh, because in a way, you know, uh, the city or the, the governmental structures are not monolithic, and uh, the the street level bureaucrats are improvising, and and they are uh, heavy, they are using all these uh, tactics of appropriation pretty much in the same way. And uh, even the distribution utility is not this kind of all-powerful company. They also have, uh, have to operate under certain constraints and they also try to push uh, the limit uh, in a very improvisational manner. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, entangled, complicated situation. Uh, yeah. Good. Um, one last question and then I'll, I will switch it to the public. Within that, within what you guys have just mentioned, what would be the role of technology? Um, you talked about the role of design as covering up this, this very um, uh, diverse uh, back end. Um, but in the activism, in the, the activism that you're talking about through FOIA requests, through a new kind of um, system, 
where does technology stand? Where does technology stand um, for us to help overcome these difficulties? Or on the other hand, where, how are sort of these um, companies using technology to hide um, the, the complexity? I, I don't know how complex it is, really. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's like, I mean, wealthy suburbs are being subsidized, you know, and they're, they're benefiting from, you know, an impoverished, um, you know, majority black city. And that's not new. No, but, you know, but, so, but, but I mean, as far as technology, I, I don't, um, I don't, I don't really look at sort of, you know, the rag is, is a kind of techne. The telemeter devices are kind of mm -hmm. techne, you know. Obviously, the spreadsheets and GIS changes how, how quick these things can happen as far as something like a, a shutoff being, you know, kind of set up on a spreadsheet. Um, but I, I, I think for me, I'm, I'm more interested as far as, because I don't think architecture means that we understand technology better than anybody else. But I do think that architecture, um, you know, means that we can, we can mediate something uh, spatially in a very sophisticated way. So, so I'm more interested in, in changing the dynamic of, of environmentalism, actually, okay. um, um, in terms of, you know, right now, there are certain kind of expectations that are set up around what environmental protection means. And, and at least in Detroit, um, that is evicting people, you know? So I'm, I'm interested in sort of how, how architecture can, can change that dynamic of what, what environmental protection looks like or how it's imagined also. Yeah, I mean, of course, I also prefer very narrow terms, but with design and technology, it's unfortunately yeah. not possible. And, and I would also say that, you know, the REC uh, is exactly, a, you know, artifact of urban technology, so I, I wouldn't really uh, draw a distinction. But, but what I think is, is used very strategically is the rhetoric around technology. It's, it's, it's not so much uh, the, the material practices and... Uh, you know, devices, it's really about how those are presented. Okay. Um, questions from the public. We have time for a couple of questions. Raise your hand if you want to ask somebody. I think, come on, nothing. Yes. Uh, in the back. Uh, my question is for Dr. McEwen, but uh, anybody can have a go at this. I'm so not a doctor. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, I really like the point that you were making about the meters as evidence, but somehow this meter doesn't deliver the evidence mm. to the person that can use it or doesn't mm -hmm. really produce the evidence, um, which is a fascinating point. But I wonder whether we really need the evidence that it's gonna give us and whether we don't have enough evidence already. I mean, what's sort of the devastating yeah. thing in watching all of these crises happen is that we have more than enough evidence and really the rhetoric of reception around evidence needs to change. I wonder if you have thoughts on that. That's, I, I, I heard Wendy give a talk last night um, that I, I think was very convincing around this, um, but I'm talking about evidence within a legal process. And, and I went down a whole rabbit hole reading way too many um, kind of moments of these ongoing federal EBA cases in, in the state of Michigan. And you would be shocked at, at the ignorance of the, of the judge. And it was one judge for decades. So, so um, I mean, at one level, there has to be a kind of an alternative to uh, the, a certain legal uh, format for how kind of the environmental protection is adjudicated, and that's not, I, I don't know what the answer is, and it's not my field, it's not my discipline, but to the extent that that is what we're set up with, where there is, there is a judicial process, that process needs to be um, delivered much more rich evidence um, that is spatialized in a much more intelligence way, intelligent way. I mean, even asphalt, they don't understand asphalt, you know, much less bringing in the, the, the data from the, the test pumps and, and understanding the flows and the risks related to that. It also ties in into the whole history of uh, these environmental laws, EPA lawsuits in the 70s and uh, Supreme Court, where it was all about nailing down scientific evidence and it would basically go, okay, uh, you know, 0 0.1 uh, above or below. So it, it is, I, I think it's a very legal uh, concept of evidence that is uh, manifest here. Yeah. Yes. 
Hi, thanks very much for your presentations. Um, one of the things that I thought both of the presentations brought back into the conversation was this issue of maintenance. Um, maintenance mm. and, and the importance of a certain kind of labor in the production and reproduction of infrastructures. Um, and that, I mean, I think kind of goes to the, the question that wasn't answered in the first session about gender, um, you know, because part of what the smart city seems to be doing is not so much, um, it's not so much about what the technology does, but the forms of labor that it obviates, um, and particularly different types of reproductive labor. So the way that it reorganizes labor in the city is, is you know, obviously one of the things that's being optimized for. Um, you know, whether it's traditionally domestic work uh, or the kind of maintenance work done by, uh, you know, um, people who work on electrical lines or, and since so that has a gendered dimension, obviously, but um, the, the goal is really to uh, optimize the ratio of a certain kind of knowledge economy, high value labor in relation to um, labor that is uh, less costly and thereby also kind of control the power that uh, people who work in those types of uh, um, economies uh, have in the smart city. So it's really like, to me, the smart city is not so much about you know, an intelligent city, but it's more like a kind of counter counter intelligent city, that it's about bypassing the forms of intelligence and power that people who work uh, in a certain kind of maintenance of the city and its infrastructures um, would otherwise have. Um, so I wonder if you can just talk about that, like how you understand the role of labor in relation to the maintenance of the city and what technology or infrastructure um, and the various kinds of projections of that from you know, uh, municipal governments um, is trying to achieve vis-a-vis -vis the, the labor of the city. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm totally with you on the, you know, also what Muriel uh, Eucalyst talked about in her main maintenance art manifesto where she contrasted this, you know, heroic act of design versus uh, the, you know, um, invisible maintenance. And uh, from my view, it's, it's, it's definitely the, the maintenance part is definitely where the actual creative problems are solved uh, because the devil is in the details and yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> That's my answer as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, we're going to leave it there. Um, stay here for one of the for Wendy Chun. He's, she's going to be speaking in five minutes. Okay. Thank you.